My name is Tim Mackey, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, a question of trust um, when good containers go bad. And so um, I'm going to take you through a couple pieces of journey uh, that are specific to the way that open source software works. Um, give you just a little bit of background as to who I am. Uh, my current title at Black Duck is Senior Technology Evangelist, but I've been a community manager within the Zen uh, world for uh, a number of years now. Um, some of the cool things that I've done are listed up there and um, all the normal, usual social places you can find me on the internets. Um, so in order to start out with how good containers go bad, uh, we have first have to take a look at how software is developed. And I'm going to start with a set of assertions. And the assertions are going to be around security-driven development um, that we have collectively all learned about over the course of the last six, eight, ten years how to develop software more securely. Um, we've empowered our engineers with uh, security information. We've given them training on how to uh, develop software more securely. We've baked security into our release processes. Uh, we use only trusted components when building applications um, that we fundamentally are creating uh, components that we can now sign and attest to the origin of and that we're only deploying things uh, from trusted registries of one form or another. And uh, if we stopped here, we'd probably uh, be reasonably okay. But um, obviously, if we're following every single one of these concepts, uh, what can go wrong? So earlier this year, CSO Magazine put out a, an article that said that the easiest way to get sacked in uh, 2017 was to have a security breach. Uh, this was in March, um, long before Equifax became a topic of conversation. Um, IBM and the Panamon Institute in the US, uh, they do a study every year on data breaches. And this year's study came out in July. And what they found was that the average cost of a data breach was just over 7 million US. And the lost business associated with that was a little over 4 million US. And that importantly, the average time to identify and remediate a breach was a little over six months. Now, I want you to remember that six month number because it's actually important. I'm going to be using um, Equifax as a bit of a case study throughout this. Um, they actually did better than the average, uh, despite all of the um, negatives that they experienced as a result of that. Um, one of the negatives, of course, being that when they uh, released their uh, breach information, uh, within four days, their um, valuation on the U.S. stock market was down 36%, um, which is a little bit um, unfortunate for them. Now, here in Europe, we're going to have, in May of next year, GDPR to contend with. And one of the assertions that I make uh, is that security-driven development also needs to have privacy by design inherent to it. And as we move forward with uh, GDPR, one of the things that I'm most fearful of is what I refer to as security fatigue within the public. That if they go and they take a look on their uh, evening news, that there will be a, a listing of, and today we had these companies that are disclosing violations or breaches as a result of uh, GDPR and the disclosure that we had on last Friday from uh, company X, well, they're now going to amend it and this is the new information that we have out. And the public at large will start to tune out what to do around security. And so we need to be uh, collectively more attentive to ensuring that we don't end up in a breach situation lest we end up in a situation where the public doesn't know how to react. And what I can say, being on the American side of the equation, the American public does not know how to react to Equifax. They do not know what to do best. They're busily changing their passwords on accounts that they don't know why they're changing them on. They're busily going and uh, looking at credit monitoring services, not realizing that Equifax was a credit monitoring service and that they might have another issue down the road. They don't know what to do and GDPR gives us the potential for that to be a reality. So when I look at infrastructure, and I'm fundamentally an infrastructure guy, I look at all of the things that we've done over the last several decades in order to protect ourselves. And unfortunately, in a lot of organizations that I work with, the infrastructure team has solved my problem is a pervasive uh, thought. So if I take users, 
accessing through perimeter defenses some form of infrastructure, and it's going to be containerized infrastructure. That containerized infrastructure looks like this. I have some form of compute network and storage in my node. I, being a Zen project guy, am very beholden to, there are lots of things that hypervisors can do well that containerized solutions like Docker cannot today. And one of those is to provide appropriate segmentations in assisted hardware. So I'm going to have a hardware uh, hypervisor in place. I'm going to have some form of supervisory function with that uh, virtualization solution that is going to implement software-defined networking to ensure that only the activities that are appropriate to that node are being contended with. I'm going to throw in a security service that is going to be monitoring for things related to rootkit access within my host so that if I end up with a host that is compromised through whatever vector that I can attest to it, and that I have some number of virtual machines that are going to be uh, container, uh, going to be hosts to containers, and that inside those virtual machines I have a minimal host OS, say a container Linux, for example, or a Red Hat Atomic, or a Rancher OS, or any of a number of other uh, minimal OSs, and then I'm going to deploy n containers in there, and then I'm going to replicate this across this node, and then fundamentally, of course, throughout the cluster. If I've got this as my, uh, my paradigm, I still have a scenario in which that container can become, quote, vulnerable. Not because of anything that the infrastructure team has done, but because of things that happen in the outside world. A new security disclosure could happen at this particular instant in time that changes the security state of the application that is hosted inside that container, a new CVE disclosure. So if that's happening, and suddenly I change my users to be a malicious actor of one form or another, who is now in a position to be able to compromise that container, if my entire security thesis is based on the fact that, well, I have all of these layers of defense, and I now have a compromised container, and I didn't have to go and patch that vulnerable container over in the corner, well, I've now created a beachhead scenario where that attacker can move laterally, which is the last thing that we want to have happen. So tenant number one in how good containers can go bad is that the good container that has passed every single security test that might exist is subject to external changes. People find issues in software that is part of that software stack. And so that's what, first and foremost, that we need to be aware of. Which causes us to want to question everything and continually reevaluate the trust that's in there. So for example, where did the base image in my container come from? Did it come from Docker Hub? Did it come from a trusted re uh, registry? Did it come from a vendor? What is the health of that image? Who built it? How is it to be patched? If I'm pulling it from a tag, what happens if the tag goes away? Because tags are mutable. Humans can modify them. And that pull spec can go away. What happens if the registry that I pulled from goes away and I'm trying to scale my cluster? What if an update mirror goes down associated with my build process? Did I bake security into my build systems themselves? How am I updating the images in the face of changes that are out there? And it's fair to say that for most people, this is going to cause their head to hurt. Um, and that this is fundamentally a lot of work. And for practical purposes, there's a lot of nuances that are part of container solutions that people don't necessarily get. So I'm going to give an example of why all of this matters. Um, so a lot of organizations have grown up through proprietary software procurement processes where a relationship is established with a uh, software vendor. And as part of that relationship, there's going to be some form of communication that says, here's a security update for my software patch. And procurement agencies the world over work with this. It's the way that uh, most organizations expect software to be consumed. There's security teams that the vendors are going to have in place. It's a nice model. Open source software particularly upstream software, behaves very differently. If you don't establish a relationship with that project, you don't have one. They're not going to proactively notify you about anything because, among other things, they don't know, and they're largely a volunteer organization anyway. This means that if you're not actively engaged with that project, you have a level of risk. Some organizations will then say, but I never want to have any open source software but the way the world works today is through open source software. So let me highlight 
a nominally security communication from an open source project. This is from MediaWiki, and the highlighted yellow pieces, I'll read them out. Um, they're the relevant pieces. So this is a maintenance update for 126, 125, 124, 123 release cycle. And the first yellow piece says, various special pages resulted in fatal errors. That's the extent of their security disclosure. I, as a MediaWiki admin, it's up to me to figure out whether that is something that applies to me or not, or what fatal error might mean. Then they also include a note about end of life support. Please note that the 124.6 marks the end of support for the 124 series of releases. Technically, this ended a few weeks ago with the release of 126.0. However, 124.5 had issues along with other versions, so it was thought fair to fix them. If I'm an enterprise building a policy around the consumption of this software, this is not the type of thing that I want to be reading. I don't have any level of consistency or communication that's going to be in here. But this is also the way that open source works. It's a volunteer organization developing software that is all out there for our benefit. Put it another way, let's say that I have a potential attacker. And that potential attacker has a job to do. And their job is to figure out how to attack your infrastructure. And your infrastructure is running whatever it's running. However, one thing is known it's likely running some open source software, which means that they have access to it. Now, the attacker is going to come up with a thesis, and he's going to run that thesis against various platforms at his disposal. And some of those tests are going to fail. And he's a smart, resourceful in individual, and he will iterate over those, and eventually those will pass. Now, he's got a test uh, case that works, potential attack that is legitimate in his opinion. So next thing he needs to do is map that into a deployment vehicle. And there are multiple ones to choose from. Prove that it actually does work. So record a video of him attacking something and post it up on YouTube. And if he's really, really, really lucky, the PR department comes in and Sky News, Fox News, what have you, will pick up on this and then uh, evangelize effectively his success. Now, we don't necessarily know who he is, but within his community, he's now got a success that he can go and attach his name to. If this looks like a software development life cycle in a commercial environment, that's because it is. That's his job. He's learning the same things that we're learning. His motivations are just a little bit different. So I want to take a look at a a real vulnerability. And so the vulnerability that I'm choosing is one that's got an embargo associated with it. An embargoed vulnerability is what happens under responsible security disclosures, where a researcher goes and identifies an issue, works with uh, the project maintainers or uh, commercial uh, implementers of that particular uh, open source component or commercial vendor to go and develop a set of fixes that it, uh, account for the scenario that has been seen and everybody discloses the information at the same point in time so that no one, particularly malicious actors, have an advantage. The one I'm choosing is CVE 2016-5195 which was from roughly this time last year. And on the 18th of October of 2016, Linus Torvalds, who is the core maintainer for the Linux kernel, posted this message associated with a set of commit changes. And again, I'll highlight the pieces in here. This is an ancient bug that was actually attempted to be fixed once 11 years ago, but that was then undone. So he's established a point in time. He's now fixing something that was a security issue that goes back 11 years. That's a very long time. Also, the VM has become more scalable, and what was a purely theoretical race condition back then has become easier to trigger. If we think about the types of computer systems that we were deploying 11 years ago, now 12 years ago, they were single core per socket, maybe hyper-threaded, maybe single dual quad socket machines, if we were really lucky, quad socket. Today, you'd be hard pressed to find just a four core socket, 8, 16, 24, those are more the norm. In other words, there's a lot more concurrency available in today's processing environments, which means that race conditions become much easier to trigger. So effectively, in this message, dated on the 18th of October, that he actually started development on for the 13th of October, he has established a timeline. On the 21st of October, the embargo expires. So anyone who has the ability to read Linus's 
message from the 18th now has a three-day advantage. Various vendors, Red Hat, SUSE, Canonical, they've all got their patches, IBM's got their patches, and we then know this as dirty cow. It was a copy on write vulnerability impacting the Linux kernel and all versions of the Linux kernel for the last 11 years. Now, in the US, we have this lovely holiday um, that is called Halloween, and children like to dress up in silly costumes and go and get candy. Uh, adults like to dress up in silly costumes and go and have parties. Um, we at Black Duck, we believe very much in having fun. So here we have Madeline. Madeline is one of our sales team. She dressed up as Dirty Cow. Um, that was her costume for the, uh, the company party. Um, that's on the 31st of October. Now, most security disclosures come through the National Vulnerability Database in the US, and it looks like this. Now, this particular vulnerability was actually disclosed to the public on the 10th of November. So from the 21st of October, through people dressing in silly costumes, there was media activity, there was a silly logoed uh, website, dirtycow.ninja, but there was no meaningful information in an NVD for a full three weeks. That's opportunity for a potential attacker. We need to close the loop on that. Now, if I look at the types of exploits that were out there and the assertions that were made, we ended up with something very interesting. So that list that you see up there, I prepared that earlier this year. At that particular point in time, there was about 25, 30 different exploits that were out there. The initial assertion around this particular vulnerability was, first, it's not remotely exploitable. Well, the researcher countered that by saying, I found this by looking at my web logs. So yes, it's remotely exploitable. But the initial media coverage said it wasn't. If you took your cues from that media coverage, you might be deprioritizing something that is significant. There was assertions that virtualization protected you. Some virtualization did, but not all. There was assertions that in a containerized environment, you couldn't do a breakout. Three days later, the breakout code was posted. Deadbeef.c. It uses a different memory ma uh, management strategy than is typically used in the Linux operating system and demonstrated proof of concept breakout. The point being that vulnerabilities aren't point in time events. Vulnerabilities have a life cycle to them. And if you're only reacting to that point in time event, then your good container might actually turn out to be bad, again, with no changes. So if I look at the landscape of security solutions out there, they really get broken down into uh, two possible scenarios, static analysis and dynamic analysis. And we'll throw in some form of injection analysis or instrument, instrumentation analysis. Those are focused on the code that you write. It's going to be a hard conversation to go to your VP of engineer, VP of operations and say, I want to go and take my Coverity scan tool and apply it to the Linux kernel. That's quote, somebody else's job. Or to apply it to the Docker runtime. That's quote, somebody else's job. Focus your attention on our code would be the conversation. Then there's vulnerability analysis. That works looking at everything that you're dependent upon. And today, because of the way open source works, you're dependent upon a lot of open source. And the way open source works, you might not be dependent upon something that is through a mainstream distribution. You might be dependent upon something that is a fork or a branch in the code from some upstream that made sense to whoever the developer was. And so having that level of awareness is important. Now, I've talked about security researchers. We're all security researchers. When we find something, we need to report it. In the world of open source, that's a little bit harder, but was made easier uh, about 15 months ago with the I want a CVE project. It's a simple GitHub repo with Docker form, oh, with Google form, where you can go and report an issue that you believe exists within the open source that you have and have somebody go and actually run that through its work cycle. Because Community development got us to the successes of open source. We want to bring community development into the security side of the equation. Give you a couple of other examples. So 
point in time decisions are a real problem when it comes to how open source is consumed. So last year in September, there was a 620 gigabit per second uh, attack known as the Mirai bot. It was an attack uh, that was predicated through nanny cams, um, DVRs, thermostats, internet connected devices. And when you looked at how this exploit was working, it was actually exploiting a vulnerability in OpenSSH dating back to 2004. Specifically, the allow TCP forwarding flag. So this vulnerability predates the whole idea of IoT. And if you look at that particular disclosure, what you find is that it describes a world that doesn't even relate to anything that is today. It talks about development paradigms. Nothing about that disclosure relates to the way of the world today. That's still the exploit vector. If you go and go one step further and take a look at the man page for OpenSSH and the flag that's for allow TCP forwarding, its default value is true. And there is a note in there that says, quote, this is not a security vulnerability which, by the way, if you ever see this is not a security vulnerability in anyone's uh, documentation, question it. Don't trust that statement. It further goes on to say, this is not a security vulnerability because you would need to use this in an internet-connected device, thermostat, with a well-known username and password, admin, admin, as it turned out. And thus was born the Mirai bot. Um, Apache Struts earlier this year didn't just hit Equifax. It hit uh, the Tokyo Prefecture with all of their um, taxation. Um, it hit the Canadian Revenue Agency, Canada's taxation authority. In Canada, they actually went on the evening news and said, we have disabled your ability to electronically file your taxes because of a security vulnerability we have detected. We will re-enable this once we have patched it. You do not need to worry about any deadlines because we have the ability to extend it. Your information is more important than our deadline. It took them a better part of a week to get that sorted out, turned it back online. They were on the evening news saying, we fixed it. We believe that we're okay. If this happens again, that's what we're going to do. You can now, in all good confidence, file your taxes. And then, of course, the uh, perennial favorite of open source security people, Heartbleed. I lost six weeks of my life to Heartbleed, um, but why are there still 200,000 public-facing websites as of January of this year that are vulnerable to Heartbleed? There's no good reason. Unfortunately, we do a lot of uh, analysis at Black Duck, and we see that there's a long tail to some of these things that measures in years, a little over four years being the average. So I mentioned Equifax. I'm going to take Equifax's um, uh, environment here, and I'm going to decompose the CVE 2017-5638, which is the vulnerability that they got hit with. In August 2012, the code that was part of this bug was introduced, and that's exactly what it looks like. That is all four lines of the code. Importantly, it's an error message builder that was returning a localized piece of text and there was some other code at the beginning. November of 2012, Struts 2.3 was released off of that same branch. In May of 2016, Struts 2.5 was released. That same code more or less came intact. In March of this year, we had the patch. It took that localized fine text, which could return null and gave it an error test. That's all the patch was. <coughs> That's all that issue was. So that gives us now Equifax uh, received the disclosure on the 7th of March. The National Vulnerability Database in the US uh, was a little bit faster than it was with Dirty Cow this time and picked it up in seven days. Um, this is the prepared testimony from now former CEO of Equifax in his uh, statements before the American US Congress um, explaining his situation. So on March 9th, Equifax disseminated the notification internally by email requesting that applicable personnel responsible for Apache struts upgrade their software. We now know the vulnerable version of Apache struts within Equifax was not identified or patched. On March 15th, Equifax's Information Security Department also ran scans that should have identified systems that which were vulnerable. 
Unfortunately, these scans did not identify the strut's vulnerability. Dum, dum, dum. It's complicated because in that timeline, it's possible that they patched the issue and had a regression because somebody went and deployed something that they had as an approved image. There are many possible scenarios to get through this timeline and say that Equifax was doing the right thing. Now, they then had hacks being successful in May um, and actually discovered it in July. And importantly, at 144 days, we're better than the average that IBM and Ponemon figured out. The moral of the story here is that unless you truly have continuous monitoring, if you're using ad hoc scans, you're not going to be able to see what you need to see. Um, which gets us to how open source development really works. So I'm going to go quickly through this because um, we're a little bit behind on time. Um, when a new project starts to be developed, everything's about features and functions. Security really isn't part of that process. Features and functions work because I'm trying to solve a problem that I care about. Then as time moves along, other people become interested in my solution and I need to have a, a little bit more of an awakening associated with my uh, security posture. As more people come along and want to use this, I may have uh, release-based scans, something I do before each release. I may start tracking things in spreadsheets or using some low-cost tools because I just need to get it done. And I'm an open source guy, not a commercial guy, so I don't have a whole lot of budget to spend on these things. But eventually, if this be uh, project becomes a big thing, I want to make certain that I've got this completely automated and I bake it into my CI such that I know exactly what's going to be in the environment and that I've got this continuous monitoring in place. So automation is the key. And I'm going to assert that there are two key pieces of information that you really need to be looking out for. We've talked about vulnerabilities. Point in time decisions are equally important. I might decide that I want to use version 1.x of a component. And if I have this mindset of commercial software, version 1.x, I'll be notified when that's end of life. In open source, that's not the way it works. In open source, when the developers decide that they've gone on holiday and they've come back all nice and relaxed and tanned, well, they might go and work on version 2.x and never touch 1.x again. And it's only if you're engaged that you recognize this. So end of life could equal stable, could equal dead. And you need to be aware of this because when the time comes to patch an environment, you need to know that there's a patch that exists so if you're 10 versions old, patching that might be a little bit difficult. And if that's embedded in some user space that's coming from a trusted artifactory instance uh, that you've vetted, you've introduced risk while trying to be more secure. So having that level of awareness is important. Understanding the commit velocities is equally important. We don't patch containers. We know that that's a, a bad practice. We patch the image and we respin and redeploy the containers. We use the container orchestration system to our advantage. But that doesn't mean that we have to ignore whether or not the container system is actually helping us or not. So in this case, again, going back to struts, let's say that I am here and I wish to patch. I can go to any of those three versions that I've highlighted on the screen. They do, in fact, patch the vulnerabilities that are present in that uh, one that I highlighted, but they're also equally worse. So did I make things better or did I make things worse by going to the next version? If you're behind, it's hard to say whether going to the latest thing is the correct answer. So patch management is different in containers but requires an equal level of understanding. We want to make certain that we're doing continuous monitoring. So if I'm building this environment and a vulnerability happens to be, quote, introduced, not because the developer did anything wrong, but because the outside world changed and the dependencies now included a uh, vulnerable component, I want to make certain that I'm performing a risk assessment in my CI and that I never create the binary artifact that could be deployed because I don't know about you, but in my history in software development, if you've created the artifact, there's a pretty good chance that somebody somewhere is going to run it whether you wanted them to or not. So never create it in the first place. Put that artifact in place, throw a defect into, say, Jira, and have the work done. 
Similarly, we want to build a risk profile across all the containers in our SDLC. So if I'm building out my environment, I want to make certain that if there's a vulnerable component inside my Git, that I don't have that inside my build environment with Docker and out in my container. Or if I'm building a pipeline, that the same thing isn't happening here, where I could have my pipelines and all my builder images similarly compromisable. Because I'm only as good as my entire SDLC's lifespan. And if I can compromise a build uh, phase, oh, now I've got the keys to everything. That's, that's the holy grail. I want to make certain that I'm supporting ongoing monitoring of risk. So if I just take a shipping scenario and I morph that into a container deployment scenario and I say that I've deployed an image and that image is now vulnerable because of something that's happened in the outside world, I don't want to be scanning all my container images. A, because I don't want to inject more code into my image in the first place. B, because I want to make certain that I'm not negatively impacting the performance of my images. But C, because I probably have a regulatory requirement to perform that scanning, monitor at the container image level. That's where we want to get the real value. And an image is an immutable uh, source to all our replicas. So we don't need to scan the replicas, we need to scan the image, and we need to know what the image has got in favor of it. We want to make certain we're doing the assessment all throughout the SDLC. Most common place, right here, right in the CI but perform the assessment everywhere you possibly can. Enable as many people as possible to have that information because it's going to be valuable information. Um, so I'm going to go quickly over the next five minutes um, through an initiative that I've been running for uh, the better part of the last 11 months, um, and that's to try and reduce security response times um, to get them from being days down to, say, an hour or two, regardless of the scale. Um, so any given day, there's about a dozen new vulnerabilities that are disclosed against this, an open source component some open source component someplace. Keeping up with that is incredibly difficult, uh, particularly when you start to look at containers. And so, come on, move forward. Um, so earlier this year, we embarked on a project uh, to bring our scanning solutions into an OpenShift environment. And for those of you who aren't aware of what Red Hat OpenShift is, it's a very opinionated version of Kubernetes. So large scale container orchestration. And right now we're working on the whole Kubernetes piece. I'm presenting this here as this is how we want to bring this thing into reality. If you disagree, challenge me, please. Um, we've done our initial releases, we've vetted it all out, but we're not by any means the expert in everything. So I've got a knowledge base that contains um, an incredible amount of open source activity. I've got a product that we call OpSite. I've got Red Hat OpenShift. One of the things that OpenShift is opinionated about is how its registry is going to be managed and how images map to uh, the actual container instances and those images. They call that an image stream. Of course, external registries like, say, Docker Hub, Red Hat's Container Catalog, uh, Artifactory, um, Nexus repositories, uh, local DTR, they're all perfectly supported. So we introduced this thing called an offsite for OpenShift connector in the middle, and its job is to monitor for act events coming from all of these systems, and in response to an event, perform a scan. Map that against all of the information that we know about, and happy to talk to you about that at the stand. Um, assess that against policy, and then importantly, annotate that information back into the image. The idea being that no one is necessarily going to want to work with a separate product if they can get the information from their console. And by annotating it back into the image, you now allow OpenShift to say, I don't want to deploy this image anymore because it no longer meets policy. And you don't have to have a human involved in it. So the idea here is to automate everything as much as possible and then have various notifications that go through. This model, we believe, is going to work extremely well. And it's all uh, up on our GitHub and it's open sourced um, so that if it turns out that it needs to be morphed in interesting ways, um, we're very happy to take pull requests on it. The idea being that we have a layered security model. Uh, another thing that Red Hat's OpenShift is opinionated about is how the hosts are deployed. So things like SE Linux are enabled by default. 
um, that you can use a tool that Red Hat has called Open SCAP to go and vet whether or not the hosts are meeting policy, but also uh, whether the containers themselves are meeting policy with respect to uh, certain uh, governance regs. So, uh, for example, some of the Department of Defense ones are up there. Um, in our case, we scan every single container image because, well, why wouldn't you? Why would you want to hide something? Um, and we make certain that that information is put back in there. Uh, the timeline for us is that from point of us being able to record a CVE's existence to the time of the annotations being updated is between an hour and an hour and a half. If we can figure out a way to make that less, that's great. But just imagine if you have, say, 20,000, 100,000 container images of being able to know in an hour which ones are impacted by a CVE. That's, that's a huge advantage um, when you start talking about malicious actors. It's all powered by uh, a knowledge base, and I've got about two minutes left, so I'm just going to skip through this to say that this is an awesome amount of data that we enhance and provide you exploit information from. Um, because at the end of the day, it's all about end-to-end -end visibility, being able to identify what you're using, map the risks that are there, and being able to automate the results. And so through all of this, we're in a position where we can say that good containers can go bad, not because of anything that you did, but because the outside world has changed around you. And that as part of your evaluation of trust, you need to be in a position where you're now able to continually reassess that without having human governance be the gating factor. And all of this, of course, is we want to stay out of the news for all the wrong reasons. So Equifax making it the worst security breach ever. Um, U.S. Congress going to hold hearings. Yeah, I don't want my boss to ever have to sit before uh, legislators. Um, they won't understand any of the business anyway. Um, and then, of course, I, would, I really like the guy. I don't want him to be fired, as what happened with Equifax's CEO. Thank you. Thank you.